Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about upcoming declaration requirements for goods imported into Britain from the EU, brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade in association with Fujitsu. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I'll be your host for this morning. And thank you all for joining us today. This is clearly a topic of great importance to UK traders. We already have a couple hundred of you on the call with more to come, so a warm welcome to you all. Indeed, this webinar will have some overlap with a session we did in May on a similar topic, and we're covering this ground again due to its importance for UK traders, so please do make sure to listen in. Next slide, please. We have a panel of two very experienced and knowledgeable speakers today. Uh, later on, we'll be hearing from Frank Dunsmuir, the Head of International Trade and Customs at Fujitsu, and a non-executive director at the International Border Management and Technology Association. Really excited to be hearing from Frank today, as there are very few people who know more about using technology to facilitate international trade. So a really warm welcome to Frank. But first we'll be hearing from Kevin Shakespeare, the head of the Institute of Export and International Trades Academy, who many of our regular listeners will know well, of course. Hi, Kevin, how are you today? How's it going? Uh, I'm good, thank you, Will, and uh, shame the weather has changed, unfortunately. <laughs> Absolutely, just in time for my holiday next week in Cornwall, so uh, thank you whoever is judging the weather at the moment. Um, as well as leading the Institute's provision of training courses and qualifications, Kevin is also a UN-approved international trade trainer, the Dean of the UK Customs Academy and Northern Ireland Customs Academy, and has worked on several trade initiatives alongside governments and export agencies across the UK and internationally. But on the next slide, before handing over to Kevin, uh, we're just going to run a couple of polls, beginning with this one, which is to find out a little bit more about your business. So we are asking, what kind of goods do you trade? The options there are standard or non-controlled goods, SPS goods, so that's goods requiring sanitary or phytosanitary checks, that could be products of animal origin or plants, excise goods, so that's uh, alcohol, tobacco, any goods which uh, incur excise duty, controlled goods, so those are military or dual use items, or none of the above. And just while you are answering that poll, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions towards the end of the webinar, though please bear in mind that we've already received quite a few questions in advance, so we'll not be able to get to all of your queries today. And just a quick tip, if you are going to ask questions, please make sure they are concise and easy for me to read. Um, that's a slightly self-interested request there. And uh, if you feel as though your question has not been answered, please do review some of the services we, we, we will be talking about later in the webinar. Secondly, you will be accessing, uh, you will receive access to today's slide pack and recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So please do try to listen in carefully to today's presentation. Right, so I'm going to quickly close that poll and share the results. So 61% of you are um, trading standard or non-controlled goods, perhaps unsurprising. 12% of you involved in uh, trading controlled goods and then 8% uh, SBS goods, 4% excise goods, and 14% none of the above. If we move to the next slide, I think we've got another poll. I'm just gonna ask you a very central question to today's presentation, which is, do you think your business is prepared to make declarations when the current easement ends? The options are range from very prepared to not at all prepared, and there's a not sure option as well. And Kevin, if I can just bring you on quickly, uh, just to explain this question, perhaps, what is the easement? And uh, well, the presentation will be covering this, but just give people an idea of what they are answering. What is the easement and uh, what are people answering this question? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Will. Um, so in, in the context of the easement, uh, the UK introduced a phased border operating model 
and 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 probably the, uh, the the main priority front of mind at the moment is that uh, from the 1st of January there was an easement put in place for standard goods and I know 61% of the attendees um, in the poll indicated standard goods that it, it was possible to uh, undertake a process entry into declarants records which means that a customs uh, import declaration was not required at the 1st of January but it needed to be made a, it needs to be made 175 days uh, from the uh, the date of import and, and it's a rolling 175 days so that is the primary uh, easement I think you should consider when doing this poll is are you prepared to make what is a requirement for a supplementary customs declaration which which is not in uh, not similar from a full declaration uh, 175 days from your date of import if you've imported goods this year. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, I'll give people a few more seconds to answer that poll in light of that explanation. But um, yeah, as, as noted, we will be covering that timeline throughout today's presentation. So if I, in just five seconds, I'll close the poll. So five, four, three, two, one. And we'll just quickly share the results. So uh, really interesting responses ever. Thank you everyone for responding to both polls so far. Um, a fifth of you aren't sure. Um, so hopefully today's webinar will, will help you get some certainty. Uh, but promisingly, perhaps uh, that's 54% of you are prepared to some extent. Um, so half of you are feeling prepared and a quarter of you aren't feeling too prepared yet. Kevin, any surprises in that uh, response? Right. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for completing the uh, poll. They, uh, the polls they, they are really, really helpful. I, I, I guess it's it's good to to see 54% prepared to some extent. Um, and what we'll be going through today is 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 building on that preparedness for the customs declaration, but also considering it's not just the customs declaration that's required 175 days after the date of import. It's the requirements of that customs declaration, such as commodity code, origin, uh, 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 the weight of the goods uh, are all key considerations as well. Great. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for answering that poll. And uh, I think we should now be able to see the slides again. So uh, over to you, Kevin, for the presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Will. And uh, formally, good morning, uh, everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is, is uh, in the agenda is we're going to look at some of the key facts around the changes in the rules, what, what those changes mean from the 1st of January and how to prepare yourself and how we can help. Uh, and we will obviously have time uh, for uh, questions and answers as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be um, sharing the platform with Frank from Fujitsu uh, and uh, myself and Frank will be going through the slides today. Thank you. So um, let's look first of all in, in terms of the changes in, in the rules. Um, so as we know from the 1st of January, the end of the, uh, there was the end of a transition period and there were changes in rules and, and, and there were a number of changes uh, that, that impacts whether you're an exporter, an importer or both and, 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 how, and how supply chains operate as well. And, and uh, those rules clearly were around uh, a lot around customs uh, around trade, but also around conformity and certification as well. So um, uh, pre-transition period, um, uh, end of transition period, so last year, um, uh, the in terms of the context of trade between the EU and, and, and uh, GB, uh, and you'll notice here that I'm referring a lot to GB Great Britain, because these rules are, are, are very particular to GB as opposed to Northern Ireland, where, where, um, uh, where different processes and procedures apply. So um, last year, um, all goods were tariff free, moving between the EU and Great Britain. There were um, uh, no checks at the borders for most goods. And there were no customs requirements, no uh, process requirements. Now, that clearly changed in the 1st of January. And after the end of it, the um, transition period, uh, there, there was um, clearly the EU-UK um, Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, and it is possible to, um, uh, to claim 
tariff free trade if you meet the rules of origin. So if you satisfy those uh, rules of origin, which are very much set at percentage level based on the product commodity being moved. Uh, there are now checks at the borders for the goods, but we will obviously refer to changes to the border operating model. Uh, and, and those checks at the border uh, as such are being phased in. So some of the checks currently, if, if they take place, would be at the point of arrival right? um, uh, in, 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 in the context, for example, of live animals, products of animal origin. Um, you will need um, entry certificates and customs declarations on, on, on goods, and we're going to look at those requirements today. And depending on the nature of the goods, um, uh, they require physical checks and, as we're going to look at uh, going forward, import pre-notification. And, and this is arising clearly uh, from the fact that the United Kingdom is no longer part of the EU Customs Union. Okay, so, so these changes for uh, clearly affect your import journey. So the focus today is very much on the import side, uh, the European Union to Great Britain. The requirement for new documentation, um, the, the, the fact that goods may face checks at the border, also the implication potentially of uh, uh, import VAT becomes payable. Uh, it is possible um, uh, if you're VAT registered to apply the principles of postponed VAT accounting. And if, 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 if goods do not meet uh, the rules of origin requirements under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, import duty could also be payable. So um, it is very important to, that businesses remain compliant. But as we're going to look at today, compliance is a key aspect of this. But also in terms of your relations with your EU supplier, it's, it's, it's important that goods move quickly, efficiently, and the supplier customer relationship continues as effectively as possible. So compliance is a key aspect of this, but it's also around good relations, competitive advantage as well, by processing customs procedures correctly and efficiently. So let's look at some of the key dates here. So from the 1st of January, when, when, we, when I refer to the easement period, that's effectively when we started, but you'll hear me frequently refer to 175 day rolling period. So it's not six months, it's 175 days that this easement in terms of the requirement for a supplementary declaration for standard goods applies for. So a key date, and literally it, is, it will be Friday week, and it is really coming up on us now, the first supplementary declar uh, declarations are due. So if you imported goods, standard goods, on the 1st of January and you were using this easement, entering the information into, the, in, into your records, declarant records, the first supplementary declarations will be due on the 25th of June. So, that, so literally we're just over a week away now from that requirement. So it is, it is now upon us. Now, uh, other key dates in terms of the uh, are the 1st of October. So in terms of pre-notification, so this is an import uh, pre-notification are required for certain products, such as uh, products of animal origin, uh, certain animal byproducts and high risk um, uh, 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 food not of animal origin. And there is also a requirement for export health certificates as well. So that puts an onus on your EU supplier, depending on the nature of the goods, to actually uh, uh, provide an export health certificate. The onus, uh, depending on the INCO terms, and if you're if you're purchasing on um, on in any INCO term other than um, uh, uh, DDP, deliver duty paid, then you will require to make that import pre-notification for a system called IPAPS. 1st of October for products of animal origin, for example. So 31st of December, the easement period ends. So just to be totally clear here, if you bring the goods in on the 1st of July, you will need to make a declaration 175 days from the 1st of July. If you bring goods in on the 1st of March, uh, you will need to make the supplementary declaration 175 days from the 1st of March. So this 175 day um, uh, rolling period continues. 
So from the 1st of January, fronted uh, uh, declarations are required for all goods. So effectively, then we have this concept of full frontier declarations. It is possible, and, and again, happy to take questions, to, to undertake a process called uh, uh, Customs Authorization, CFSP, Customs Freight Simplified Procedures, where you, uh, where you can continue to make simplified declarations, not quite EIDR, which you'll just enter in the um, um, in, into your own, into your own records, but if you don't, full frontier declarations are required from the first of January. So this easement period ends. There will also be a requirement for safety and security declarations for imports as well. So that's also an important aspect. So you, you'll clearly work with your haulier and freight forwarder in that regard. There will be physical um, uh, SPS checks, so sanitary and phytosanitary. Um, for, for, for certain animal byproducts, for example, um, and high and high risk plants and pre -notific uh, uh, notification requirements and documentary text. So including phytosanitary certificates also required for low risk plants and plant products. So we can see different phasing depending on the nature of the product. And then from um, then we have um, uh, the final day checks at border control posts taking place on on live animals and low risk plants and plant products. So that's the phasing of, of, of the changes. So clearly uh, the poll question was probably based more around the requirement for making supplementary declarations after the end of the easement period. But clearly it's it's important to point out uh, additional changes. Now I know uh, only a certain percentage of you uh, are involved with products of animal origin. Okay, so let's now look at the process for importing goods. So, um, and again, some of these slides are just for clarification, the slides will be available to you. Uh, for, so for standard goods, we have this EIDR, entry into declarence records, followed by the supplementary declaration. Now, just a quick point on this using CFSP. I talked about it in, in terms of the 1st of January next year. But if you intend to make a, supple a supplementary declaration yourself and you're not using the services of, a, 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 of an intermediary, you will require to be authorized for CFSP by customs. So effectively, that CFSP authorization, if you don't have it, um, you will not be able to make a supplementary declaration on your own behalf. <clears throat> so that CFSP authorization becomes key. So it's very, very important to, to bear that in mind. It's not just simply a case on the 25th of June, the 28th of June going in and say, I'm going to make my supplementary declaration. Because you to do that, you, if you're going to make it on your own behalf, need to be approved for CFSP and authorized by HMRC. And you have to apply. So um so e e effectively, non-controlled goods, so standard goods, again, may enter under EID part, uh, EIDR processes with supplementary declarations, this rolling period easement for 175 days. OK, so um, some of the key takeaways from this, um, th th this slide are the requirement for supplementary declarations 175 days after the date of import. And as Frankie is going to talk about in particular later, uh, what we've developed working together in, 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 in partnership is a simple to use platform, which is available for traders to meet your requirements and lodge your supplementary declarations. Um, so really, really key, and, and, and Frank will talk about that later, that we have worked to, together to meet the needs of industry and support you in meeting your requirements. So, um, uh, Different procedure for controlled goods. Um, uh, e e effectively, they require an import. They required an import declaration from the 1st of January. Um, and in the case of CITES, in in trading uh, in in endangered species, um, they must exit the EU uh, via desi uh, designated points. So, an, a very important point to mention as well from January 22. Uh, 22 is the requirement, and we're talking about imports here, EU to GB, for entry safety and security declarations, uh, and, 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 and also the likely requirement for uh, a GVMS entry, a goods vehicle movement system entry as well. Uh, yes, and you will work very much with the haulier uh, and, and the freight forwarder on those latter two items. In terms of SPS goods, there, there are the 
additional requirements very much sort of being phased in here uh, in, 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 in terms of requirements for export health certificates, phytosanitary certificates, for example, in the case of plants required. Uh, and, and we can see, as I've talked about earlier, the phasing in of those requirements for the import pre-notification and the requirement for the likes of the export health certificate uh, and, the, uh, and the phytosanitary certificate. So in the case of excise goods, uh, if goods are moving under uh, uh, duty suspension, EMCS uh, comes into play there. Uh, and um, uh, I know from the poll, several of you or a good number of you were involved in moving excise goods as well. So again, um, uh, excise goods are subject to import declarations on the 1st of January and the, and the phase in 61% of you applies to is applicable for standard goods. Okay, now th th this is really just a summary slide for GB to EU. And it's just for information um, uh, for exports to so say the main focus here is for imports today uh, and, and your requirements under the UK's phased border operating model. But just to clarify, and, and I'll just talk at this slide to some extent, if you're moving goods to the EU and exporting, you'll be very familiar with these processes, maybe partly depending on the INCO terms you're using. But the requirement there for the export customs declaration, uh, the, the, the requirement if you're moving products of animal origin for an export health certificate, for example, uh, EMCS uh, for, for, for the excise side uh, as appropriate. So uh, again, these processes are already in play and, and in the export inside, there'll be other issues, clearly the INCO terms you select the payment of VAT, depending on the INCO terms, do your goods meet the rules of origin requirements as well. But just one final point, which I sort of alluded to before the poll question. It's not just about making the supplementary declaration, it's about making it correctly and compliantly as well. That means correctly and compliantly today, but also correctly and compliantly upon audit. So you need to keep all your records for the context of in, in the context of exporting proof of export, but also on the import side, it's excellent practice as well. You really need to do this. I've spoken to a number of traders. I was at a big event last week where a lot of traders were saying, well, my freight forwarder does it for me. My, my, my fast parcel operator does it for me. It doesn't matter. Upon audit and, 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 for, and to zero rate your exports for VAT, you must have a full proof of export file which includes the evidence of the customs declaration, the transport document, ideally evidence uh, that you've received payment in the case of export, as well as commercial invoice, packing list, pro forma invoice, quotation, et cetera. That becomes really, really important because the amount of companies I spoke to last week who said, well, customs declarations made, I, I get charged for it. That's it, I've got to pay the extra cost. You must maintain proof of export. You are also liable on both the import declaration, the export declaration for the commodity code quoted, uh, the origin of the goods, uh, the, the weight of the goods, anything that goes in that supplementary declaration or the full frontier declaration, you are liable for, not your freight forwarder not your intermediary if they're making it on your behalf. It's very much yourself. So as Frank's also going to talk about, a key thing of what we're providing here as an educational element, as well as actually making the declaration on your behalf. Okay, so a, a, a quick summary of the main challenges. The large backlog of supplementary declarations. Frank will also talk about this as well. Um, is there an awareness that these declarations need to be made? Now, I know 54% of you said you're prepared um, and, and that's brilliant, but are there loads and loads of other businesses out there that are just not prepared? Not on this call today, and yeah, we have fantastic numbers. Thank you for, um, thank you for linking in today. Is there, is there an awareness and is there capability, and Frank will talk around the sort of capability to support these large backlog of declarations. The lack of, um, <clears throat> familiarity with customs processes. I've talked about commodity codes, origin requirements, etc., and high prices. And Frank may allude to this as well. 
if you do need someone to make the decoration for you, can you get it at an affordable price? That's assuming that someone can make that supplementary decoration for you. So potential risks is the accuracy. Um, it's very important that you have a good customs record with HMRC, especially if you want to use uh, uh, future customs simplifications, such as customs warehousing, inward processing, even, even CFSP authorization. So that trading history, that record becomes really important. So the accuracy, the compliance aspect as well. Clearly, there's, there's a risk of non-compliance non in terms of facing fans, uh, fines and possible bans from certain trading. There's obviously the cost if, if, if a declaration is not made correctly, and clearly delays can arise at the border. And what and what, what no one wants is uh, is is, delay, is goods to be delayed, and the supplier customer relationship is soured, and, and people don't want to deal with each other. Businesses don't want to deal with each other. So really, really important to 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 get things right and get support uh, for your business. Okay, so um, th these are just checklists for you, and, and again, these slides will, will be available. So very important to agree your sales and commercial terms, your INCO terms. Um, very important to set up a duty deferment account and, and register for VAT if applicable. Uh, I'm sure, hopefully, most of you have your GB EORI number. Happy to take a question later on EU EORI numbers, which only apply, uh, the, the requirement only applies based on certain INCO terms used. Uh, and obviously to check, are your goods standard goods? That becomes very important as well. Are you actually sure your goods are, uh, are standard goods? Make sure you actually uh, identify what you've imported. Um, so go back for all your records, what has been imported? And is there a backlog? And what steps are you going to take to clear that uh, uh, backlog? And if applicable, apply, uh, sorry, don't need to apply, uh, you utilize postponed VAT accounting. Okay, so um, I'm going now to uh, to pass over to Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and a great overview of the new processes and how it may affect uh, businesses that are moving goods between Great Britain and the EU. Um, so what I'd like to do is I've got about three more slides uh, to walk you through in terms of the options of how your business may um, meet the requirements of the new customs um, procedures and processes in particular. Uh, and in addition to customs, you've also got um, things like DEFRA uh, requirements if you're moving food products, etc. Um, so first of all, in, in terms of the marketplace, the, the sort of options that are there. Um, there, there. Until now, there are two core options. You can either do it in-house yourself if you, um, uh, if you have that capability, or you can you can seek a customs intermediary um, and outsource um, those customs uh, uh, processes to to uh, a partner company like that. Um, in house is fine if you're um, if you have experienced uh, personnel. Uh, if you may be involved in rest of world um, procedures today and customs procedures, so you may well have that capability. Um, and that requires obviously maintaining your own team, maintaining that team's knowledge keeping them trained in latest uh, processes and legislation uh, and having the right software to access um, either chief or CDS platforms in HMRC. Uh, and on the right hand side, we have customs intermediary services. They provide, uh, customs agents provide a valuable service today. Sometimes fre freight forwarders um, step, step into this space as well. Uh, and they'll look after your customs procedures for you, taking information from you and creating the right declarations and, um, and output requirements. Again, that's a process well established in the market, um, and you're 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 pay you'll pay typically by the declaration for those sort of services. And some of those companies may offer advisory services, or you may go to consultants to say, "Am I optimizing my supply chain in the best way, or how would I use inward processing relief, or other more complicated processes?" Um, and as of tomorrow, there's a middle there's a middle ground there. Um, which is the digital trader services that we're launching. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk you through what this means in, in, in the next two slides, but this is a new way of um, achieving um, customs compliance, creating your customs declarations on, on the new easy to use platform uh, and, and process. And it's probably best if I explain that in the next two slides what the digital trader service is. So on the next slide, the reason why we launched it is as Kevin alluded to, 
Uh, we've done a number of polls. We've talked to a lot of organisations. Um, we're, we're always talking to organisations, um, not just part of this process. Um, but we carried out a number of polls, well over a thousand organisations, and uh, in terms of readiness for uh, trading after Brexit. Uh, and what we came up with, we summarised what they told us in, in, in three messages, which, which Kevin alluded to earlier. Um, uh, the key challenges they, that they, they look at at the moment, and these are recent surveys. So, first one was uh, I've got a lot of a lot of supplementary declarations to do. Um, so, they're taking advantage of the easements, and goods have been coming in from the EU without frontier declarations, and they're now looking at how they start to clear that backlog. And for some organisations, it's many thousands of uh, of movements, and create supplementary declarations from there. Um, so they're looking for options on that one. The second one, and I think that's front of mind for them, is lack of familiarity with new customs procedures, and in particular those organisations that don't have um, experience with rest of world trade, um, not fully sure about what processes and procedures they need to follow. Uh, should they be, um, is it just customs requirements or are there licences and additional uh, um, uh, requirements and additional authorisations that they may need to consider as part of their process? So. Um, those of you that are familiar with customs will know it's it's a big corpus of knowledge, and there's a lot to learn in there if, if you're new to it. So it can be uh, quite daunting daunting for those who are new new to this world. Uh, and the third one is unexpected high prices, um, and and this was quite an interesting feedback. And we we've, we've actually seen this in a number of instances where costs um, are rising significantly due to uh, demand at stripping supply for um, customs agents, intermediaries, and, and that sort of service in the marketplace. So um, as much as tenfold in some instances that we've heard, not all tenfold by any stretch of imagination, but there are um, increasing prices in the marketplace. And on the next slide, it helps us position where DTS comes in, the digital trader services. So uh, in order to, to manage the backlog, we've, we've created um, an easy to use platform which enables you to either use a portal, a spreadsheet, or if you've got more advanced technology, you can use what are called APIs to automate loading data into the system. So you'll take your information and you'll either key it into a portal or put it through a spreadsheet upload, and our system will then transfer that information into the chief to create the declaration for you. Uh, it sounds simple, but if if we go to number two there, the lack of familiarity is is uh, with customs procedures is, so well, how do I know what to do, what data do I need, etc. Um, so we've deliberately focused digital trader service uniquely around this challenge, um, which is, first of all, the portal is written in English speak. So as an example, it will say, please provide your commercial reference number or shipping note number. We then, in the background, take that information and, and we apply a code Z380 and the reference number because that's how Chief works. It requires uh, codes to tell to tell it uh, what that reference means. Uh, but we're not asking you for a document code. We're asking you a question that should relate to the information you already have. The easiest way to uh, analogy of this would be akin to the tax return, your tax return at the end of the year. So if you're a PAYE and you've got a P60 form, then it's fairly straightforward to submit your tax return yourself on the government's portal using their online service. It asks you questions in English and you don't need to be an accountant to do that. But if it does get a little bit more complicated, maybe you've got a business on the side or some investment somewhere that you need to be declaring as well as part of that return, you may seek a bit of advice from um, uh, an accountant or somebody like that to, to help you with that little bit. So our system is similar to that in the sense that you don't need to be a customs expert to answer the questions. But if you do have some queries about, well, if I'm moving these particular products um, and I'm re-importing them or doing something um, a little bit more different with these products than just bringing them in for home use, um, is there anything I'm missing? Do I need to do anything or worry about that? We've also got access to um, training modules, um, pre frequently asked questions, education material, and importantly, professionals. So you've got direct access um, to um, either a contact center with trained agents or 
um, more experienced consultants um, that, such as Kevin and myself, etc., where you can actually ask questions about um, how you need to, uh, what procedures and processes you, you may need to follow or consider, and even things like, um, have I got a good model? Uh, is my supply chain really optimised for the way that customs works in, in the new world? So highly um, uh, valuable uh, service that's not just easy to use, but also uh, guidance and mentoring and uh, and support. And then finally, the unexpected high costs. So it will be pitched in a, a competitive price point, depending on the nature of your requirements and volumes, etc. But it will be pitched at um, a, um, a market competitive price. And there are additional benefits in the service like this, where you, as I mentioned before, you have access to education and, and consultants, uh, advice and guidance, etc. And, uh, and intermediaries within our company who can help you through the process as well. Um, but in terms of the pricing points, uh, that will depend on the type of service you uh, you require, etc. But you can find out more about that um, directly on, on our website. And on the next slide. I think I'm handing back to Will. Thanks, Frank. And uh, thanks, Kevin, as well. Really, really interesting presentation. Um, really. Uh, really is such an important topic. So thank you for that presentation. I hope everyone has found that useful. Um, we're going to do a quick poll before going into the Q&A. Um, and this is actually a repeat of the question we asked earlier. Do you think your business is prepared to make declarations when the easement ends? So we're here tracking uh, whether um, some of the information here has uh, will change the response. So uh, again, I really appreciate um, any responses to this poll. Um, just while you were answering that, I'll get the Q&A off and away. Uh, Kevin, I'll start this one with yourself, and there might be one thing we we'll, want we'll to input into uh, afterwards. But uh, the question in from Jim, who's asked, do you expect longer delays of a border when the easement ends? And I guess this is a broader question about um, what impacts do you think this easement ending is going to have, and what can traders be doing to, to mitigate that? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. It's it's a good question. I, I guess I guess the answer is it's sort of difficult to tell, but um, clearly when, when easements period ends, there's a there's a requirement for frontier declarations, uh, uh, goods subject to border controls, uh, 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 especially certain types of goods. Then uh, there is potential, obviously, for for risk there. There are things that businesses could consider, such as um, uh, uh, use of CFSP, but um, uh, but that requires authorization. I think, as Frank's alluded to, one of the reasons we've developed this service is to really give the opportunity and try and support the business world to avoid these sorts of risks, possible delays arising. So it is important for businesses to prepare. Uh, we, we, we do appreciate, cert certainly for small, medium-sized businesses, it, it can be harder, which is why we try to introduce this service to to support businesses. But, um, but first of all, please recognise if you're importing goods that action is needed. Thanks. And Frank, I don't know if you want to add in, anything to that. Yeah, I, I just added a couple of things. First of all, um, even if the processes are, are completed um, perfectly and you've done everything you need and created all the right documents, there, there is likely to be some sort of extra stickiness at the border. Um, because we're introducing these these new customs procedures, so that that um, should be as light a touch as possible. Um, so, for example, the GVMS system, if you're aware of it, seeks to remove uh, a lot of that stickiness. So, if you have a, a vehicle with groupage and you've got lots of consignments on there, uh, lots of declarations, etc., then you put that information into to GVMS, and when you get to the border, you've got one record, or the driver has one record, one number, um, and that can be cleared. Uh, quicker than producing 10 or 20 declarations one at a time. So there are ways that HMRC and, and border, border agencies are working to, to speed the process up, make it less sticky. Um, there will invariably be some uh, small percentage uh, of vehicles pulled aside for a check because you're now subject to customs processes and procedures. So they'll make sure there are some um, small percentage of, of checks. I would imagine there's small percentages. Um, so, so there'll be a little bit there. The thing I would I would um, uh, advise to to look at and, and prepare for is particularly around uh, food and products of animal origin and livestock. So, as we as you saw from Kevin's presentation, the easements uh, as they are um, 
gradually reduced and uh, border uh, post ins border inspection points are, are put in place uh, in particular around livestock and food products um, they will be subject to 100% um, documentation check and livestock 100% physical checks so um, there's a degree more uh, to be aware of there in terms of what I call the stickiness around around those particular products in particular so to do do be aware of those and plan those around your your operations as it were Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Kevin. I uh, hope that's been a helpful answer, Jim. Um, obviously, a lot to be keeping your eye on in terms of what's going to, to happen in the next few weeks. Just going to close the poll. And uh, really interesting, actually. So the amount of people who are feeling prepared uh, has gone up quite a bit. Uh, so that is now at 64%, 17% um, of which is very prepared. Um, and the not sure has gone down a fair bit, so that's where the shift has been. So that's down to 9% and 26% 26, 26 of you are not feeling prepared to some extent, not 21% of that being not very prepared uh, at all. So uh, hope, uh, thank you everyone for answering that poll, really interesting response already. Um, so now on to the Q&A. Um, so I think Kevin, you want to move to the next slide. Uh, another really good question in from John. Uh, a few questions around kind of um, what to be expecting from your freight forwarders or customs brokers. So John has asked, um, are, you, are European suppliers choose freight forwarders to send goods to us? These forwarders are clearly taking advantage of a 175 day rule as we have not received any paperwork from them as of yet. Should they at least be sending me some notification as I'm finding it difficult to keep track of the shipments without any paperwork? So I guess the question really is around what should traders be expecting from their um, for both orders uh, in terms of the upcoming paperwork requirements? Uh, Kevin, I'll put it to you first and then uh, open, open it to Frank as well. Yeah, again, thank you for the question. And it's, it's, it's really an interesting one. I would, and uh, I know some of you may have questions on, on INCO terms that use the international commercial terms. Clearly, the, the, the requirement for documentation and the onus and the liability is based on the INCO terms. Now, um, so uh, first of all, certainly go back to the commercial invoice, the purchase order, the quotation to see if INCO terms were, were uh, the INCO terms were quoted on there. Uh, um, if, if, if the European freight forwarder and, or hauler are chosen or selected by the EU supplier um, is delivering the goods to your premises, then it could be probably one of two INCO terms. It could be DAP delivered at place or DDP delivered duty paid. And that is quite a significant difference. Um, it, probably in a majority of cases, it's more likely to be DAP delivered at place because if it is DDP, it's the European supplier who is responsible for the import declaration, the supplementary declaration, which, uh, which the requirements start in, uh, uh, in eight days' time. Uh, they are also responsible for the VAT side of things. They would need a GBEORI number, uh, and they would also need to pay duty if the rules of origin requirements under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement are not met. So it's essential to go back and look at what the INCO terms were. Uh, if, if, if the responsibility is, is to deliver the goods only to the, the border in, uh, sorry, the uh, port or airport of dispatch in the EU or, or, or the UK port, it's likely obviously to be another INCO term that's used. So, but you should, if it's, if it's DAP delivered at place and you are responsible for that import declaration, um, then you require certain information. Uh, clearly, you should you you should have a commercial invoice. Uh, you should have a packing list, ideally. Uh, you 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 should have the um, and the uh, uh, transport document as well, or sort of evidence of that transport document. So all this becomes really really key and important. So uh, I know I've sort of gone on a bit around the inco terms, but they are fundamental. But if if the proverbial lorry is turning up at your premises or the courier fast parcel operator is turning up at your premises, you need to be very, very clear. And it is more likely to be DAP delivered at place unless you have negotiated DDP delivered duty pay. So a key requirement. Frank, I, uh, would you like to add to that? Just a couple of points. I think you've said um, the, the main cover the main points, Kevin. Um, actually seen a number of organizations have this problem where um and in a couple of cases they said i oh, know we're fine everything's arriving as normal um and then when when we dug into it it was ah 
we've got a backlog, haven't we? Um, so goods were being delivered by their, their supplier, their, their uh, transport company, their freight forwarder, uh, under the easement, um, and they just weren't aware that they, they would have to do supplementary declaration. So the, the INCO terms point that Kevin's raised is absolutely critical, uh, but it's, it's good that people are asking this question. Um, the other point I'd, I'd make is um, if you are in that situation, then um, keep your records, your delivery notes and shipment notes, um, as Kevin was mentioned, and your commercial invoices. Uh, and do my advice will be start to create your, your data set. So make sure you've got commodity codes and all of the criteria that you'll need in order to make a declaration. On the digital trader service, there is a, um, a spreadsheet upload facility, and that spreadsheet gives you all of the data points that we would need to create a declaration for you. Um, so the advice is don't wait till uh, the declaration is due. Start start getting that data ready now and get getting it um, prepared so that you can submit declarations. Great, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, a few quick fire questions on DTS. Uh, so uh, David has asked, when is the uh, the new service going live, and what is the cost per declaration? Uh, Frank, um, do you want to do this? Yeah, it goes live tomorrow. Um, uh, tomorrow about five-ish, I believe, so end of day. So in 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 a, in a way, we we. We're moving that. It's effectively Monday, isn't it, for a lot of organisations? But um, it will it will go live tomorrow with the spreadsheet upload. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you, I mean, one of the for, for a smaller organisation, if you're not moving that many declarations through, uh, then the price point would be around about forty-five pound a declaration, uh, which gives you, as I mentioned before, the ability to to create your declarations in a simple way and access to help and support, etc. So if in your submission to Chief there is an error, we fix that and we, we, we make sure you get the declaration back. Or if we don't understand the information you put in, we'll contact you and ask you um, clarification questions. So it's quite a comprehensive service. And as you move towards the enterprise level of organizations that are putting hundreds of declarations through a day, that price point will drop to something like half the, um, the value. Um, but, but for uh, for those sort of volumes, etc., that will be something that will be um, designed and built probably specifically for those organisations. But that, I, di I didn't want to hide the uh, the price point question there, so hopefully that gives you a view as to the sort of price point that, that they'll be at. Thanks, Frank. And a follow up from Thomas, who's asked, "Do I need to be CFSB registered to use DTS?" Uh, no, we'll we'll provide this is one of the real benefits of the. Um, as a service, so we will use our CFSP authorization. Um, so uh, you're, you're, you don't have to have CFSP, which which would normally take a few weeks to get get approved, etc. And and require you to answer customs questions. Excellent, great yeah. stuff. Thanks, Anke. Yeah, no, no, I think uh, I think just to um, just to add to that point on on CFSP is is there is an authorization process as Frank said that, that you have to go through. You also have to demonstrate customs compliance as well. So it is harder for small and and, and medium sized businesses to actually mm. demonstrate have that knowledge of compliance. And you do have to answer quite a number of questions. So uh, again, th there is that element that the digital trader service is very much there to support you, and and we are CFSP approved on effectively on your behalf. Great, thanks, Kevin. That's um that's an important point. Thank you uh, for adding that. And actually, a question which may follow up from that. So Stefan has asked if authorised by HMRC already to use EIDR um, after the end of the easement period, would this still be an option to use instead of doing uh, some frontier declarations? It sounds as though EIDR would not be an option for non-controlled goods from EU going forwards. Uh, Kevin, do you want to just explain around that question? Yeah, so again, thank you very much for the question. That, that, that's correct. So if, if, we, if we view EIDR, we, we view it in terms of the easement. So, it, so it's, it's, it's an easement which ends on the 31st of December. So after the 31st of December, uh, effectively EIDR as we know it as an easement no longer exists. You, the only way you can make simplified uh, declarations going forward will need to be you would need to be CFSP customs freight simplified procedures authorized from the 1st of January. 
so um, uh, next year, and then you can make simplified declarations. But you, it, it is a simplified data set, but you still need to make that simplified declaration. You can't do what you're doing now under the easement of just enter, en, enter the uh, information into your own records. Thanks, Gavin. Um, we've got time for a few more questions because we do have a, a couple more slides to go through as well. So I'll just do a couple more. Um, a couple more on DTS. In fact, uh, how do you sign up to DTS? I mean, we can share the um, the details after this webinar in the follow up email. But um, if, uh, in terms of uh, the URL, does does that come to mind, uh, Kevin or Frank, and the URL to go to? Yeah, digitaltraderservices.com. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. Good stuff. Um, a question from Nick who's asked, if using the DTS tool, can you consolidate entries, i.e. more than one shipment per entry on the system? Frank, do you want to do that one? Sorry, well, I missed the last bit of that one. I was Sorry. busy checking my URL there. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, the very last point, sorry. So can you consolidate entries, uh, i.e. more than one shipment per entry on the system? Yes, yeah, so you can group them in a number of ways. So if the commodity codes uh, are the same on your on your delivery, then you can typically um, uh, consolidate by commodity code, provided they're all from the same um, country of origin. So the, 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 you know, it may be um, ladies' shoes, same commodity code, different different styles of shoes that are on your on your um, invoice, but you can consolidate those up, so that saves you numbers of lines. And equally, if you've got um, uh, three or four deliveries a day, etc., you can you can consolidate those into one uh, one declaration as well. So there's a number of ways of consolidating. Um, those are the most common ways. Uh, but if you if if you're using the di digital trader service, then we're not restricting number of lines or, or adding costs per number of lines, etc. So it's it's more about an input efficiency than cost. And again, if you have specific questions about could I do this with my um, delivery notes, can I consolidate the following way? Then again, we're happy to help with those those types of questions specifically. Thanks, Frank. Um, and we've had a few questions in around Northern Ireland. So obviously, we've been focusing on GB EU trade. Um, but some people have asked around um, what support is there for moving goods from NI to GB or vice versa. Uh, Kevin, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, clearly the, the, the requirements under the, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, are, uh, are, are different in terms of trade. So the requirement for moving goods for, uh, uh, to GB, uh, GBNI and in, in a limited number of circumstances, the requirement for an, an export declaration when moving uh, goods from uh, NI to GB. So for example, uh, uh, certain controlled goods and goods require licenses. So um, the, um, th there is the Trader Support Service, TSS, uh, 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 which is there, which is a free to use service. So I, I would uh, I, I would recommend that anyone uh, goes to uh, goes to the traders uh, uh, support service um, and uh, and and obviously looks at the requirements. There is also the Northern Ireland Customs and Trade Ac uh, 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 Academy NICTA as well, which provides information on the requirements for for moving goods. So effectively, the requirement for an import declaration. Uh, 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 from moving goods or an import declaration into Northern Ireland when goods are uh, are moving from uh, from GB from from Great Britain, and the, also the requirement for an entry safety and security declaration in Northern Ireland. But if you go to both the Trader Support Service and Northern Ireland Customs and Trade Academy, it will talk through the process and 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 if you like how to operate use the uh, uh, free to use service uh, also obviously work with your freight forwarder and your haulier in that regard as well thanks kevin uh we've got time for one more question for now in a way because we've got a couple more slides to do again as mentioned earlier if we didn't get to your question today these will be informing some faqs which will be going on to the dts site and as uh, frank has alluded to um there is custom support as part of that service so um your questions will not go unanswered, just uh, just make sure to, to, to follow up with us. So a question in from Ray, Kevin, you trailed this earlier. Uh, how do you apply for an EU EORI number? My understanding is that you have to be based in the EU for this to happen. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in, 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 in first of all, the requirement for an EU or EORI number comes into play depending on our good friend, the INCO terms used as well. So if you are if you are purchasing your goods on X works terms, uh, and 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 um, you are you are responsible for collecting and loading the goods at the um, uh, at the EU suppliers premises, you require an EU or EORI number on the import side. Uh, and on the export side, if you're selling under DDP, delivered duty paid terms. Now, it, it is, um, and I guess if, if it's DDP, you've also got to think about the VAT as well. So it's not just the EORI number. But if we're only talking around, let's use the X work scenario here, you should be able to obtain an EU EORI number. In practice, a lot of businesses have, have gone to either Southern Ireland and the Netherlands uh, to, to, to to, to obtain the EU EORI number. There, is, there isn't necessarily a requirement for, for legal establishment in the EU to, to obtain your EU EORI number. That doesn't mean that can't change going forward if, if there's misuse or, if you like, abuse of, of, of businesses obtaining uh, EORI numbers for certain purposes, but there isn't necessarily that requirement. Uh, but again, we would suggest give yourself time to obtain your EU EORI number. Uh, make sure all your records, your information is in place, but if you're exporting, also consider the VAT implications and the, and the potential requirements for an EU VAT number, which then brings into play possibilities around uh, fiscal representation as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. There's been absolutely loads of really great questions. I'm sorry if we couldn't get to all of them today, but uh, thank you everyone for all the questions you've you've asked, and I hope that Q&A session's been useful. But uh, I'm going to hand back to Kevin now for just a couple more slides. Thank you very much indeed. So um, I'd, I'd just like to finish and thank everyone very much for your attendance to fantastic questions today. So um, uh, in, in, in terms of a brief overview of the Institute of Export and International Trade, we're very much committed to support UK's export performance, imports and, and, and supply chain, trade in services as well as trade in goods. So very much there to, to help and support businesses. We, we now have, we've seen big growth in our, in our membership. We now have 4,700 members and growing both corporates, businesses and, and individuals. And we just had a major reframe on our website in terms of our, our, our membership and our, our, our membership uh, uh, proposition. Uh, there are some there are some benefits of being a member of the institute in terms of we have a technical help desk and we've seen a, a sevenfold surge this year in, in in the number of inquiries we, we've received ranging from rules of origin, free trade agreements, VAT, commodity codes, uh, a real surge in, in the level of inquiries on our technical help desk. Uh, we, we offer training. Uh, there, are, there are benefits to, to uh, being a member in terms of discounts on training courses, also consultancy and business support services as well. So, so the Institute uh, have, a, have a, a wealth and what we also do is we have internal specialists employed by the Institute and a pool of internal specialists that are very much there to, uh, to support uh, uh, businesses. Uh, here's here's a, a testimonial information from Radwell International in, in terms of the actual benefits and the support from the Institute that we provide. Um, and it's very important to, to mention in terms of there is a, a combined Institute membership and digital trader services offer as well. Um, so the enterprise uh, uh, package um, for, for, for businesses with a larger number of, of declarations includes membership of the Institute of Export and International Trade. And then the premium uh, package and uh, the premium standard and the standard package also gets a 15% discount uh, on, uh, on IRE and IT membership. Um, and this is open to current members as well, not just new members. So, and I'll pass back to Will now, I think, for a final poll. Thank you. One last poll, yes. So, thank you everyone for the responses so far. We just want to get a sense of your interest in hearing more about the combined IUE membership and digital trader services offer. Um, so, uh, yeah, please do respond to that poll. And just while you are answering that, I'll begin to wrap up. So, thank you once again to Kevin and Frank for your advice and time today. 
I hope everyone has found this session really useful because obviously there's some really important uh, changes coming up. So I hope that's been useful, everyone. Just a reminder that we will be sending all registrants a recording of today's webinar, along with a copy of the slides over the next couple of days. Um, but for now, I'm going to leave this poll running as people leave the call. Um, I can put myself on mute. And uh, please do let us know what you thought of today's webinar in the exit survey. But uh, thank you, everyone. And I will close the poll in, uh, I'll close the webinar indeed, in about a minute. So thanks, everyone, for attending and speak soon.